Tonight on Primetime, it is the invasion of the canines as Philadelphia goes to the dogs. But first, a treasure ship sinks to the bottom of Delaware Bay. Two centuries later, the mystery unravels before your very eyes. I'm Gary Papa with stories that are ship-shaped and as good as gold. Tonight on Primetime. It's the prime time of my life Doing what I always dreamed I'd do Feeling free and being me In the prime time of my life Sailors call it the nasty North Atlantic, and it has sent thousands of ships to their graves. Nowhere are those storms more treacherous than here, along the coast of southern New Jersey and Delaware. Through the centuries, the ship salvage industry has always found work in these waters. But for centuries, the most fabled wreck of them all has eluded the experts. Her name was the Debrock, a British warship bristling with cannons and loaded with silver and gold from captured Spanish ships. But her luck ran out in the Delaware Bay within sight of Lewis, Delaware. It was the 25th of May, 1798. She had just come to anchor when the storm struck. The Debrock capsized, taking Captain James Drew and a dozen crew members with her as well as a reported king's ransom in Spanish treasure. Now, since then, American and English salvage crews have been trying to locate the Debrock's wreck site. All attempts have failed until now, until Harvey Harrington solved the problem. I think uh, I've uh, done my homework. I've spent uh, three and a half years on the research. Other people, in my opinion, have been looking in the wrong place. Harvey is president of Substyle Incorporated, a diving salvage company. Using his research, highly sensitive radar and navigational equipment, as well as just plain common sense, he located the Debrock in the late summer of 1984. And his divers are working round the clock, seven days a week, weather permitting. For months now, the salvage vessel has been anchored directly over the Debrock. Topside, it is all 20th century technology. But 80 feet below, it is an 18th century time capsule. That is more precious than gold to nautical archaeologist Jim Reedy. Essentially what you've got is an entire 18th century naval community that was wiped out, if you want to use that word, in what amounts to an instant of historical time. It's uh, virtually intact, sitting on the bottom, uh, of course, the hull of the ship is gone, but all the artifacts, all the material that is there are items that were in use uh, at the time the ship sank. These two artifacts, like these pistols, they were recovered from the captain's cabin and are being kept in fresh water until the destructive chemicals in the ocean water are dissolved out. They, uh, they're just exactly the type of thing that a gentleman would carry in his coat pockets when he went for a walk in the evening. In the short time that the divers have been working, they've recovered materials that are amazingly well-preserved, such as this decanter. It's just about the finest that would have been available back then. And this musket. The ship evidently was quite well supplied with small arms. They've also recovered these gold Spanish doubloons. And you might think that these would take top prize as buried treasure. But that is not so. The most exciting find of all so far has been this gold ring, which company president Harvey Harrington wears with a mixture of pride and awe. I think that was perhaps the most important day in my life, the day the ring was found. The day the ring was found was also the day that all the skeptics had to admit the Debrock had been found because the ring, beyond any shadow of a doubt, belonged to James Drew, 
the captain of that ship. The inscription inside the ring reads, in memory of my beloved brother, Captain John Drew, who drowned January 7th in the year 1798. And Captain Drew, Cap James Drew, had a brother named John, I believe it was his twin, who was drowned on uh, HMS Cerebus when she sank in Plymouth Sound in January of 1798. Archaeologist Jim Reedy remembers how he almost missed one of the biggest finds of his professional life. I'm the first guy to get all the material that comes up so I can go ahead and log it. And I looked at it and didn't notice much about it. It was just a nice little gold ring, and I handed it to one of the other divers that was on deck. And the next thing I heard was the fellow's voice reading the inscription on the inside. And the entire ship just went into pandemonium because it was, you couldn't have done better if you had found something written by Captain Drew saying, this is the Dubrock, this is my ship. Finally, after 10 weeks of watching other divers bring up priceless artifacts from that ship, Jim himself is gonna go on board just as soon as he puts on his visiting suit. Up till now, he's been required to stay topside because he's working for the state of Delaware, not the salvage company. Under Delaware law, the state claims 26% of whatever treasure is recovered. And it is Jim's job to make sure that the state gets its share. Today, for the first time, he's gonna take an up close look at just how big that share might be. In that near zero visibility, you know that anything that glitters has gotta be gold, which can make tough diving mighty rewarding. In this side of a place that had been dug away a little bit, just saw a gold edge, and I knew right away it was a gold coin, even though I'd never found one before. You just knew it, like, plucked it out, looked at it, looked like the day it was minted. Yeah, I think for everybody here in the crew, it's a very special, rewarding type of job. Uh, I don't think they'd be anything that can top this from now on. Jim Reedy would agree, if he could just catch his breath. He's been mighty busy down there, and he has pushed himself to the limit. But oh, what a sight he saw. I knew pretty much what I was, you know, what I was going to see from having talked to the guys and heard their debriefings and all like that. But uh, it's one thing to expect, to know what to expect, and it's another thing to really be able to, to see it and experience it. And this is, this is some experience. This is quite a wreck. It's... Uh, it's pretty much of a dream, really. I'll be mighty lucky if I get uh, get another experience like this one. I don't mean, just mean this dive, but I mean working on this project. It's, uh, it's just incredible. Just call it a solid gold junk pile. It's like, like a, an immense pile of treasures just lying all around. It's quite a, quite a, I don't mean treasures like gold and silver and whatnot, but pieces of old ships. That's the kind of treasures that I'm interested in. Harvey Harrington shares Jim's sentiments. You've, you've seen a gold coin, you've seen one, you've seen them all. It's, uh, it's the artifacts that really, really have brought this thing together and, and how well preserved they are. And uh, it's also the workmanship in the ship and, and the artifacts. It's, it's just unbelievable. But Harvey also knows that if he's going to retain the investors who are funding this operation, then he better come up with some silver and gold. There should be some gold, silver, actually the coins which we've already found, uh, jewelry which we've already found. Uh, I've, we haven't run into any gold bullion or, or silver yet, but I, I assume we will find it. On this wreck, I'll believe it when I see it. And these state police will guard it. There's enough of a belief in the existence of treasure to place a round-the-clock guard on board, just in case those Spanish doubloons attract some modern-day pirates. Now it's time for the salvage divers to go to work. Well, the first thing will be... O.B. O'Brien from Maine will be the first to go into the water, and his first job will be to send up a cannon. It's all ready to go. All you got to do is shackle into it, and... Uh... Then I'll be taking that airlift that you saw us throw over a little while ago and moving that over to the area I'm going to be working. Now, yeah, give me a little more volume, Joe. Uh, how's that? How's that over? Uh, good, real good. The radio's working, the gloves are on tight to keep out the cold, and Obi goes to work in the dangerous waters below. I got a bag? Yeah. yeah. You got one, you're ready. Oh, okay. 
as air hoses and communication cable slide down the anchor line and he is breathing easy even as the water closes over him once he's down on the wreck it's good news it's a little hard to believe you got good visibility? Yeah, Roger that. Obi has no trouble attaching the cable around the cannon, and the winch starts turning. It is a nice, calm day, but this winch cable is a thread of history that connects us to a storm almost two centuries ago. continues to rumble as Obi's bubbles seethe on the surface. Yeah, Roger, you got too much good visibility. He is down below using the airlift, the same way as this diver works a wreck in the Caribbean. And he's hoping to make this same kind of discovery way back when. This is what all the fighting was about, why crews risked being torn apart by grape shot, fired at close quarters by cannons, like this one, now, at last, breaking the surface. This old instrument of war may not look like much now, but to enemy crews, it was a terrifying new weapon, a lightweight cannon that could quickly be loaded and aimed with deadly effect. Even now, it seems almost to want to speak. Meanwhile, Obi is prowling around the captain's cabin, glad to be done with that cannon. Okay, Obi, can it? Well, we'll pick it up another day. Go ahead back there, listen. Yup, yeah, Roger that. You talk me into it. And we go for home with our peaceful artifact, ready for a long process of restoration. As we head back to the shore, a good omen. The sun lays out a carpet for us. What else? A carpet of gold blues. Come here, come here. Come on, up on a seat. Morgan. Okay. Come on. That a boy. Oh, see. Good, good. boy. Oh, that's good nice. Boy. Good boy. <laughs> good boy. Oh. Holy night. <laughs> Get your guy to the dog show. Twenty-five cents. None of us will ever see anything like it again. The American Kennel Club celebrating its 100th birthday by putting on the biggest dog show in history. It was held in Philadelphia, and most of you saw the highlights right here on Channel 6. But with all that, there were some things you just might have missed. I'm talking about all the weird and wonderful things that went on behind the scenes. So follow me. We'll show you what it was like those last few hours before D-Day hit Philadelphia. Our story begins here on this farm in Concordville, Pennsylvania. It is home for a Westchester lawyer, Sam Ewing, and his 40 Irish wolfhounds who love to race across these beautiful pastures. But along with this healthy exercise, they gotta look sharp for the granddaddy of all dog shows that is just a few days away. They need to be combed and have their uh, long hairs around the ears pulled out and the edges trimmed on their feet. Throughout America, this sort of thing is going on with all 141 breeds of dogdom that will be competing at the Centennial Show. And for people like Sam Ewing, their love of dogs is taken to the limit. He's the largest breeder of Irish wolfhounds in the East, and he'll be taking 20 of them to the show. He calls them his gentle giants. But when they are chasing, don't get caught in the middle. Witness Sam Scar above his eyebrow. I was going between two shows, and I stopped to exercise the dogs, and two of them were chasing each other around and came up and knocked me down from behind. And, uh, I wasn't paying much attention, so it was done by the dogs. It was really my fault for being negligent, but they were having a good time. They didn't see me there, so. 
Yet these giant dogs get on fine with the cat and with the geese. Sam's pride and joy is Yui, who is the reigning wolfhound champion in the country. And just a regular house pet kind of guy when he's not winning ribbons. Take a look at this country scene. It is hard to imagine that at this very moment, Philadelphia is going to the dogs, more than 8,000 of them, setting up canine trailer camps or checking into hotels like this one, the Franklin Econo Lodge in Center City, Philadelphia. We expect approximately 400 dogs in the hotel this weekend. The people that are staying overnight are coming from all across the country, parts of Mexico, Canada, and parts of Europe as well. The Lodge has pulled out all the stops for its pedigree guests, laying out the gift-wrapped dog biscuits and an exercise area with sanitary sawdust. Into this splendor enters a borzoi, Carmela Valentina, who's about to blow her chance for stardom. Here, Carmela is being introduced to the Franklin Lodge sales director, Sandra Norton. Say hi to Auntie. What's your name? Sandy. Auntie Sandy. Oh, we got a golden Sandy at home, a golden oh retriever. Goodness. Our cameraman wants Carmela to sit next to Sandra. Makes for a nice group shot, you know. Okay, let's set up the shot. Come on, Carmela. Sit. That's it. Push the dog down. We've got to get this interview started. Sit. All right, then. Forget sit. Just don't stand up. Listen, you think you have to go through a lot here? All you have to do is look. Some aristocrats just can't follow orders. Now, if you think Sandra has problems, meet Mary Lou Erlacher. She is in charge of a convoy of dog buses. Mary Lou is the sales director for the Ashburn Transportation Company in Northeast Philadelphia. Normally, they supply most of the school buses for the Philadelphia School District. That is routine. But during the next four days, Ashburn will be responsible for delivering thousands of dogs and owners to the tightly scheduled show competitions. And Mary Lou will be in charge.